All right, so this video is going to be on conjugated dienes. We're going to do some reactivity. We're going to do some fancy stuff too. So um, here we go. We've got a conjugated diene right here. Here's another way that we might draw a conjugated diene or discover it here. So the question, we have seen this type of question before where it would be like, are these identical or are they stereoisomers, right? Um, and so we have to remember to look at the bonds about like on either side of those pi bonds. And so we got trans, cis, and then cis for those, right? So let's take a look at the second pi bond. I'll highlight those in blue. And uh, around that bond is this first one's trans, then it's cis, and then the last one is trans. So we've got three different combinations for this, uh, this particular conjugated diene, okay? And this would be considered a 1,3 diene. Now let's take a look at uh, these compounds just redrawn a little bit differently, okay? So again, if we're looking at the bonds, we have a trans-trans, a cis, uh, cis, and then a cis-trans orientation, right? So these are all identical to the compounds above each of them. And these are pretty much just three stereoisomers drawn with three different conformations, okay? So, uh, or I guess each of them has this single conformation drawn below, okay? And that's something that we should be able to do to identify whether or not something is a uh, stereoisomer, just a different conformation, so an identical compound really. Um, and then as a reminder, that conformation is just basically done by a bond rotation about that sigma bond. So let's focus on this pink bond right here that I'm highlighting. Now above in those structures, we I'm also highlighting the pink bond. And then if we take a look at how this bond rotation would look, we can rotate about that sigma bond because sigma bonds are free to rotate, remember? Pi bonds cannot rotate. Uh, and so if we did that, it would look like the one below. Same thing with the second and the third one. That's how we get these different conformations, okay? So it's just that's all that the conformations were in Newman projections, right? It's different conformations like gauche or anti or stagger or whatever. Those were all just bond rotations by 60 degrees, okay? And so that's the same thing here. Now we have terms associated with these, and this would be the uh, S transformation, trans conformation on the top, and then the S cis conformation on the bottom. So what, does, what are the definitions of those, right? So S cis conformation is basically when you have two double bonds and they are on the same side uh, of the single bond, okay? So we can see that if we drew a plane straight through that pink bond, we have the double bonds on the same side, right? If we drew it on the above structure, they're on opposite sides of that dotted line or that sigma bond. And so that's why the top one would be trans. So what's the definition of it? We can probably define it ourselves already, but S trans conformation is when we have two double bonds on the opposite sides of the single bond, okay? Now, the way I kind of remember this term is like S could stand for like single bond or it could be sigma bond. Um, but either way, we already know it's cis and trans as well, though. So it's kind of like the same idea as cis and trans alkenes, but now are you working with S, the sigma bond, okay? Hopefully that will help remember. Um, but then our stability of conjugated dienes. Again, we, we've already got these skills, right? The ideas and the concepts associated with this um, are hopefully deeply ingrained in our brain already from first semester. We just have to probably remove a few cobwebs to remember this information. But um, let's take a look at this pi bond here. Ethylene is 134 picometers. That's the PM. Remember, that's bond length. The sigma bond, uh, so ethane, is 153 picometers. And then the sigma bond in between this diene right here is actually 148 picometers. So that's actually... Even though it is a sigma bond, a single bond, it's 148. It's in between the pi and the single, okay? That's because those two carbons are sp2 hybridized, while the other sigma bond is uh, between two carbons that are sp3 hybridized, right? So remember, what's the significance of that? 
Well, when we have more S character, those electrons in the bond are held more closely to the nucleus. So they're held tighter, and so therefore there is a shorter bond. And it's also inherently stronger. So although those, that's not the stability of the, the conjugated dienes, it's kind of related to the strength. And um, it is some necessary information for us to, to have in our head. So... Um, but more related to the stability of conjugated dienes, I want to reintroduce the idea of cis and trans alkenes. Remember when we talked about the stability of these cis and trans alkenes, we did tell you trans was more stable, and then we told you because of sterics, but we also proved it with um, by using the heat of heats of hydrogenation. So if you were to hydrogenate the cis and trans uh, butene, the, to butene, then you would get the same compound, which is butane. And so we ended up using that heat of hydrogenation to determine which one was more stable, and it turned out trans was. Okay, so if we do that for this particular pentene compound, we get pentane, and it releases negative 255 kilojoules per mole. If we do that for the uh, diene, the conjugated diene, sorry, it releases negative 226 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so what does this tell us? Well, if it releases less energy and it ends up in the same final point, which is pentane, then that means that it had a lower energy starting material, right? Lower energy starting material. Okay, and so that means that that diene on the left bottom the one three diene is more stable than the one, uh, one two three four diene. <laughs> the uh, so that that is to say that the conjugated diene is more stable than the isolated diene. Okay, so I'll highlight or make note less stable for the top compound. It is an isolated diene. Okay, and this again is just because we can use heats of hydrogenation because they reach the same final point. And so we just compare the amount of energy that's released. So when doing problems, so the problems related to this question or this, this concept is, are they're pretty easy, but you really just have to pay attention to the wording because it can be a little bit confusing. So which dyne has the larger heat of hydrogenation? Okay, so when you say larger heat of hydrogenation, you want to make sure that you're really paying attention to what that means, right? So larger heat of hydrogenation would be, in this case, the minus 255 above. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the larger heat of hydrogenation means that it is the less stable alkene or diene or starting material, whatever you want to write, right? And so now it's really easy. We can just say like, okay, well, where's the isolated diene in this case? And you can look at your starting materials. So there's one, two, three, four p orbitals all in a row. So that's a conjugated diene. And then this guy right here on the right would be the isolated diene and therefore has a larger heat of hydrogenation. So let's take a look at these two cyclohexenes, hexadienes. This guy on the right, yeah? Because it's not a conjugated diene. All right, so now another problem would be to rank the following compounds in order of increasing uh, stability, okay? So again, when we're, we just have to focus or pay attention to the words and then I like to just write myself notes like, okay, so increasing stability, we have less stable with a little carrot or the alligator, whatever you wanna call it, and then most stable on the right, okay? It also helps me if you're writing this down to eliminate any ambiguity, okay? So uh, if you could label less stable, most stable, that'd be great. Um, now we've got these two, or sorry, these two rings fused together with the pi bonds in different areas, okay? So there's three different structures that we're comparing. So let's just go ahead and highlight what would create stability or instability, okay? So we've got pi bonds here, or p orbitals, if you will. And then um, we see that they are all far apart from one another, not they're only isolated. And we've got this one right here, where we do have 
these four in the middle all next to each other, right? So these can, four consecutive p orbitals allow for um, conjugation, right? Or resonance structures. And so since we have those four consecutive p orbitals, that does provide some stability and is therefore more stable than the structure on the left. Looking at the one on the right, we actually have six, one, two, three, four, five, six in a row, okay? And so if you have six in a row, that means you have more resonance structures and therefore it is more stable than the other two. So what we can do is draw our little alligator uh, as follows, okay? And there you have it. So make notes for yourself when you're doing these problems, like what does this question mean? What is it asking? How can I simplify it? Because there's a lot of words, you know what I mean? Word problems are usually not uh, students' favorite things in the world. So, and that's really all we're working with. So electrophilic addition, and that's, we're talking one, two versus one, four addition, okay? So the reason why we have one, two versus one, four addition is because we now have two uh, alkenes, right? And within one compound. And so we can get fancy with our electrophilic addition process. So first things first, remember uh, electrophilic addition of HBr to an alkene was as follows. We just added, remember we added the hydrogen or the H plus first to the alkene because that is a nucleophile. And then we follow that up with our bromide attack of a carbocation intermediate, okay? So what about this guy? We have this 1,3-butadiene and we add HBr. I put a happy face because you guys are so stoked right now because it's about to get weird. Um, let's say we have this isolated diene right here, 1,4-pentadiene. Uh, and we have this 1,3-butadiene. So let's say we add HBr, and what are we gonna get? Okay, so we can get H, the hydrogen and the bromine being added across the double bond. And that can happen on the left side or the right side, right? We want that bromine to be added to the secondary position because it is a more stable, it's the result of forming a secondary carbocation, which is more stable than the primary carbocation. So we have a more stable carbocation intermediate, by, and that's how this product is formed. Sorry, I should write one equivalent specifically, because we have two alkenes now. Now, what do we form for this guy? Well, let's just add the HBr across the same pi bond, right? Uh, we form that secondary carbocation, stoked. But here's the, here's the tricky part. We also form a this compound where we have a shift in the pi bonds. What? Are you serious right now? So we got the one, two, three, four label on the left and the one, two position. That's why this is called a one, the HBr was added to the one and the two position. And that's why it's a one, two addition product. And then the on the right, we have the bromine added to the one. Oops, messed up my structure. One, two, three, four. So let's, we had, forgot a bond. Um, and then the bromine and the hydrogen were added to the one and the four position, just counting from left to right, not necessarily nomenclature uh, following the rules, but that's the case here. So um, I'm sorry, but how? What's up, Marky Mark? You guys know about Marky Mark? I feel like that movie, was that was probably like, I don't know what movie, it was an M. Night Shyamalan movie for sure, pretty sure because there was nothing blowing up behind Mark Wahlberg in that. Um, all right, so, except his mind, just like yours right now. You're like, what are you talking about, Jess? You got a 1-2 addition and a 1-4 addition? How is this even possible? Well, look at this a little bit carbocation intermediate, guys. If you see that, you know you have a resonance structure that's possible, so why not draw that resonance structure as a possibility of moving that pi bond, because that's what we ended up seeing in the final product. Boom, shifting that guy. He's a little shifty. Um, we got the proton or the positive charge on the right now. We have an allylic carbocation, and so therefore resonance stabilization is a thing, right? It's something to consider, and um, it's almost like a, it's just like a carbocation rearrangement that we saw in previous chapters, right? <clears throat> and so, what do we end up getting? Well, if you look at the top structure, leaving it. 
uh, where the carbon cation for originally forms, we get that one two addition product. And then if we do the resonance, uh, so move that pi bond over, we get the one four addition. Now, when you look at these um, compounds, I want you to think about which one is actually more stable. Okay, so we got the one two on top and the one four on the bottom. So let me just write this for you guys. Which product is more stable? Now think about this in terms of uh, alkene instability, right? So we have a mono substituted alkene on the top and we have a di substituted alkene on the bottom. So therefore this guy, this di substituted alkene is going to be the more stable product, okay? the top one is a mono substituted alkene and it is less stable and so this is important because in the past when we've done chemical reactions our kinetic and thermodynamic products are the same um, i'll introduce these ideas in just a second but uh, basically we didn't have to worry about what we're about to discuss but now that we have two different products coming from this diene um, we kind of have to discuss the idea of kinetic and thermodynamic products okay so let's just go ahead and put this in like a more or less nicer looking format or chart but we have our butadiene one three butadiene forming our one two and one four product okay so at low temperatures which i'll write in blue in this case let's call it minus 80 or minus 78 degrees you might see um we get 80% of the one, two product and then 20% of the one, four product. Okay. But at higher temperatures, so like maybe room temperature or up like 40 degrees Celsius, um, we get 20% of the one, two product and 80% of the one, four product. Like, are you serious right now? That's fancy. We're talking about it right now. This is crazy. So we can selectively choose which product we want just by altering the temperature. Okay, and if you don't know or remember, low temperature, minus 78 degrees Celsius is basically mixing, instead of an ice bath, it's mixing acetone and dry ice. Okay, um, just a little fun fact for you. Remember that, actually, write that down, think about it. Um, so, what's really cool, even more mind-blowing, is that if you take the 1-2 addition product, heat that bad boy up to 40 degrees, you're going to get a shift in the product formation to get the one four product the majority of it that's pretty neat so the product on the right sorry the one four addition product is the thermodynamic product and then the one two addition is the kinetic product okay so why is this why why the names right so kinetic product is because it forms faster okay it's that's what like Kinetic is movement, right? So um, the kinetic product is forming faster while the thermodynamic product is more stable and it's, it predominates at equilibrium, but also equilibrium is achieved at higher temperatures. So the higher temperatures are we're associating with thermo heat, so thermodynamic product, okay? Um, and I don't, that's that's cool stuff. I don't know about you, but that's mind blowing. Plus, all this GIF is ridiculous right now. It's gorgeous. Um, but so let's talk about why this is the case. Okay, so let's say we have product A going to B plus C, and then A is actually going to be the carbocation in our discussion, and then one, two, and one, four pro addition products will be B and C. Okay, respectively. So. Um, Let's look at C in red and then B is blue, okay? Like the kinetic product is blue. And then let's draw out B's final energy level, okay? So we know that C is more stable because remember that was the di-substituted alkene versus B, which was the mono-substituted alkene. They both start at the same pro uh, starting material. And so let's just draw a generic curve, okay? So when we're talking about kinetic product being formed faster, then why would B form faster than C? Well, 
the only thing we know about or one of the things we know about rate of reactivity is activation energy, right? And so if it has a faster reactivity, then that's because it has a lower activation energy, right? And so that means that the transition state of C would be higher than that of B. And the curve would look like this in red because uh, C is more stable. So it comes back down on the bottom. But So C is slower, but it's more stable, right? And so equilibrium can be achieved at higher temperatures uh, because we have more, um, more, of the, more of these materials reaching or achieving the activation energy necessary to move to C, okay? So more is formed at equilibrium. Now think about that. what that means, equilibrium, right? It means going forward and backwards. So that means we can go take B, move backwards because we have such a, a high amount of energy in this reaction mixture, and then that allows it to go back to A and then achieve the activation energy and reach the more stable product C. So that's why we can actually take product B, heat the dam out of it, it goes back to A and then back to C. Okay, so that's why we are able to do that because we took the kinetic product, heated it up, and then we obtained the thermodynamic product. Super cool stuff. Um, I understand that it's wild in understanding, but um, think about it for a little bit. Let me know if you have any questions. So the one of the questions you might have is, why is B faster? Um, and if we think about the carbocation that's formed here, Think about it as if it were cold, right? So things aren't moving around as fast. And that once that H hydrogen adds to the alkene or the H plus adds to it, the bromide is in close proximity. And so it easily reacts at low temperatures because it's chilling there. It's like bromide's like, I got a negative, you got a positive, we should kick it. Um, and so that's why the proximity effect is the uh, is what causes the one to um, addition product to be the kinetic product and form faster. It's just because in order to add that H plus to the alkene, the bromine had kind of had to come along for the ride and it was there already. So it just figured might as well react. Okay. Um, so let me just draw this curve out for you. There we go. I got to fix this black one now. It doesn't look good. Oh, that's not that doesn't look good either, but we're going to leave it. So uh, this is basically the complete energy curve of this reaction, right? So we have the diene forms the allylic carbocation. Now, remember when we were talking, uh, we got positive charge on, it could have been on the left or the right, but resonance can, a hybrid can be drawn where we have the dotted line there and then the delta plus on either one of those. And so that's why A was the same starting material for forming products B and C is because we can draw A in a resonance hybrid form and look like this allylic carbocation here where it's like, it's both of them, right? So that's why I just took um, kind of like the carbocation starting material and then focused on the one curve for red and the one curve for blue. That first process, um, getting to A, is the same for both of them as well. So that's why we can just focus on that exothermic process and ignore the endothermic process. Okay, so now, um, just to point the, the few things out for this guy. Now, oftentimes students confuse this HBr addition to a, the 1,3-butadiene, um, and they think it's a radical reaction. Okay, it's not. This is not a radical, there, there's no radical conditions in this one. Um, we're simply talking about conjugation and its effect on stability as well as its ability to form that resonance structure to give you two different products, the kinetic and the thermodynamic. Now, what, what dictates the kinetic and the thermodynamic products? Uh, it's the activation energy of the kinetic product is lower than the thermodynamic product. And then the... Um, Thermodynamic product is actually more stable, and so that's why at equilibrium we form the more stable product, right? That's really the universe's goal is to just find the lower energy species, okay? So um, 
that's those are the things to focus on for this particular portion of the chapter okay all right so let's try a problem so the problems are kind of like basically like what's the kinetic product what's the thermodynamic product right so it could just be like what's the product um and we should be able to do that pretty easily, I think. Really what you want to look out for in identifying the kinetic and the thermodynamic product is look at your diene, right? I'm highlighting these bonds in red. That pi bond in red is the same spot as it was in the starting material, okay? In blue, it's at a different location. So that means that we're shuffling things around. And anytime you're shuffling pi bonds in addition of a, to a diene, that means it's the 1, 4 addition, right? So, and then the 1, 2 addition it has one of the pi bonds in the same spot. And so that's kind of how I figure it out. Uh, obviously you want to double check, make sure that your chlorine and your hydrogen were added to the one four spot and as well as the one two spot. So you can even number your, your alkenes in the beginning too, just to figure out where things were added. Okay. And sometimes it can get confusing because the hydrogen might not be explicitly drawn. I just drew the blue one in in the end, right? But you might not always be there. All right, so um, i kind of been doing you guys wrong. Haven't been giving you those solid jokes, but I got one for you. So how did the scientists get lost when they were going for a hike in the countryside? Because it wasn't his field. Ah, oh, that wasn't very good. All right, let me uh let me let me think of another one. <laughs> okay, no, this this the jam right here. You gotta remember this. Tell your friends. Tell your mama. Tell your daddy. Tell your auntie. Tell your uncle. Tell your neighbor. Just wear a mask when you do it though. Um, so a woman walks up to a library and then asks, like, uh, do you have any books on Pavlov's dogs and Schrodinger's cat? And the librarian's like. It rings a bell, but I don't know if it's here or not. <laughs> Woo! Okay, bye! Oh yeah, that's my daughter in a Spider-Man costume, just so you know. Uh, and she's casting a web on you, so watch out.